Federal policy changes were supposed to end random deportations of people who aren't criminals. But in parts of New England, it's still happening. Era Jose. They asked me if my name was Jose. Uh, and I said, yes, I am. Well, we are ICE agents. We are here to arrest you. And then he handcuffed me and took me to his car. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. We'll continue our series Facing Change and talk to Vermont farm workers. We'll also hear how Boston police are enforcing that city's pro-immigrant trust act. We'll explore the history of Dr. Martin Luther King's formative time in the tobacco fields of Connecticut and the story of how New England's biggest mountain, home to some of the worst weather in the world, became a tourist haven. Hardy mountaineers who spared no pains to make this famous resort a true home to the admiring stranger. Ye who would enjoy the sports of stream and forest, come to these mountains. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative, eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region, with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Coming up, what a young Martin Luther King learned from his time in the Connecticut tobacco fields. And a Russian hacking scandal comes home to roost in quiet Vermont. Or does it? But first, Vermont Public Radio reporter Kathleen Masterson has been listening to the stories of immigrant farm workers for the New England News Collaborative series Facing Change. Many of these dairy workers are in the country without documentation, and they've been increasingly worried about what would happen to them if President-elect Donald Trump makes good on his pledge to increase the number of deportations. Gregorio is originally from Mexico. He works on a dairy farm in Bristol, Vermont. He said through a translator that he's been living in a climate of fear. If everyone is deported, my question is, who is going to work? We are here working many hours for little money, and this is what keeps the farms running here in Vermont. Gregorio told Kathleen that he's seen friends picked up by immigration enforcement, so he worries about even driving to the store for fear of being pulled over and then handed over to immigration officials. It's a fear that, according to federal policy, Gregorio shouldn't have. Random deportations of people who aren't criminals, that's not supposed to happen. But a closer look finds it's still occurring, and immigration authorities are ignoring these policies. Here's Kathleen's story. Before we hear from the dairy workers, here are two key things to know about immigration law. First, local and state police are not supposed to be acting as immigration authorities. It's not in their purview to figure out what a resident's legal status is. That's the federal agent's job. Second, Department of Homeland Security guidelines make clear that federal immigration authorities are not supposed to deport just anyone who's here illegally. They are to prioritize dangerous criminals. And okay, there's a third thing. Immigration policy is constantly changing. Take the story of Victor Diaz. 25-year-old Diaz has worked on this dairy farm in central Vermont for nearly three years. He's one of seven workers from Mexico and Guatemala who help keep the farm running 24 hours a day. Victor takes me to his living quarters. We climb a darkened stairway right next to where the cows are hooked up to milking machines. The air is filled with the acrid smell of manure, combined with the sweet, warm scent of fresh milk. Victor explains he works 12-hour days. The farm milks nearly 1,000 cows, and he's on the night shift. I come into work at 7.30 p.m., and I leave around 1.30 a.m., and I come back in at 3.30 a.m. until around 10 a.m. In the middle of the night, I have about two hours to eat something, sleep for an hour, and then go back to work. Last year, Victor was pulled over by police and charged with driving under the influence. At the time, he had a driver's privilege card. That's a legal license that both Vermont and Connecticut offer to foreign nationals residing in those states. Diaz pled no contest in county court and paid a $400 fine. He wouldn't say publicly whether he understood that his plea could make him a priority for deportation. Yet five months later, Diaz was in Stowe with friends at a Mexican cultural event when he was approached by two agents wearing civilian clothing. Me dijeron que si yo era Jose. They asked me if my name was Jose. My name is Jose Victor, and I'm used to people calling me Victor, so it seemed strange that they would call me Jose. Uh, and I said, yes, I am. Well, we are ICE agents. We are here to arrest you. And then he said, give him my hands, and he handcuffed me and took me to his car. It's unclear exactly how Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, learned about the DUI. Representatives from ICE declined to comment for this story. But there are basically two ways ICE could have tracked Diaz down. 
First, when someone is booked by local, county, or state police, his or her fingerprints are submitted to a database run by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And immigration authorities have full access to that info. Second, it's possible that local law enforcement alerted ICE that they pulled over someone who might be in the country illegally. That opens the door to racial profiling, says James Duff Lyle, the executive director of the Vermont ACLU. Vermont has policy on the books that limits, explicitly limits local law enforcement from participating in immigration enforcement. And yet we are seeing uh, examples of local law enforcement inserting themselves into immigration enforcement uh, in disregard of Vermont state law and also raising serious constitutional and civil rights concerns. It's not only banned by Vermont state law, but the practice should have stopped two years ago when the Obama administration ended the wildly unpopular program called Secure Communities. The program created such rampant distrust of police among community members that many mayors and a few governors announced they would not cooperate with the mandatory federal requirements. So the Department of Homeland Security ended that program and replaced it with guidelines to prioritize people for deportation who are, quote, threats to national security and public safety. But immigration lawyer Enrique Mesa says in many cases, local law enforcement is still alerting ICE anytime they encounter someone who they suspect is here illegally. Mesa is based in Manchester, New Hampshire, but has clients in both states. Here in Vermont, uh, that I have seen is that if you are picked up for driving without a license or DUI, the prosecutors or the police will notify ICE. Mesa says that's not supposed to be happening. ICE had strict guidelines. You're only supposed to be going after criminals. Now, a DUI is a deportable offense. It's considered a second-level priority, which falls below a slew of high-priority crimes, including terrorist acts, espionage, and aggravated felonies. Unfortunately, um, ever since the election, I've been seeing in in my neck of the woods in New Hampshire that even for a simple driving without a license, uh, ICE is just picking picking people up and just detaining them uh, left and right. In fact, in New England, anywhere from one-third to one-half of people who ICE issues detainers for that's a request to local police to hold that person, have no criminal record and have not been arrested before. Miguel Alcudia is one example. He works on the same dairy farm as Diaz in central Vermont, and he was picked up by ICE earlier this year on the grounds that he's living in the country on an expired visa. It was a Thursday, and I was on my way to the bank to cash my check, but I was detained before I got there. ICE arrested me. But I don't know why, because I'm not a priority to be deported. I'm not a criminal. I came to this country just to work. Alcudia asked the ICE officers why they were picking him up. Well, they admitted that someone had called about me. The ICE officer who detained me said he had gotten a call from someone who told him about me. Both Alcudia and Diaz are awaiting their deportation hearing in front of a judge in the coming months. Like so many in deportation proceedings, their fate rests on the immigration judge's discretion and his or her interpretation of the ever-changing immigration policies. That's Kathleen Masterson from VPR reporting. If you want to see the farm where some of these men work, go to nextnewengland.org for a video. The farm workers we just met are a few of about 400,000 immigrants without legal status living and working in New England. In mostly white Vermont, many of them fear they'd be easily targeted because they stand out. In Boston, that's not the case. In fact, the city passed the Trust Act in 2014 to reassure immigrants that police wouldn't turn them over to immigration officials. But as our next guest reports, there's a loophole in the law that allowed police to turn over nine men to federal authorities. Maria Sacchetti covers immigration for the Boston Globe. Welcome to Next. Thank you. First of all, explain what Boston's Trust Act is. The Trust Act basically says that it doesn't want the city police in the business of helping to enforce federal immigration laws. And and to prevent that, the act says that the police may not detain someone for ICE if that person has been ordered released by a judge. So say the police pick somebody up for driving without a license, which is a crime, um, and then the judge orders them released on bail in that criminal case uh, or, or any other stop, um, then... Uh, Then what the Trust Act says is that Boston police may not detain that person any longer uh, so that immigration officials can come and pick them up. In the past, police have been 
helpful, not just here, but across the country, um, and they still are, uh, in, in holding people so that ICE, with its limited resources, can, can come and pick somebody up for deportation. I'm going to read a quote here from the city councilor who proposed this act. Uh, he says, by breaking down barriers to cooperation and allowing police to allocate their limited resources more productively, we will be able to enhance the efficacy of our local law enforcement and maintain the fabric of communities across the city. End quote. So uh, has it been doing that thing they suggested? Well, that that's an interesting question. It's It's hard to say. I mean, immigrants, certainly at public forums, you know, they feel they are fully aware that uh, that these policies are in place and they feel more comfortable, they say, calling the police if if there's um, anything from a car crash to if they hear gunshots or um, or in domestic violence cases. Uh, people are really afraid that if they call the police, that um, the police will start to ask about their immigration status and uh, and and try to, you know, turn them over to immigration officials. And people say the Trust Act really, uh, makes immigrants feel much more comfortable with the police. They they will more be more likely to turn to them for help. Now, your most recent report, though, shows that despite this act, there's a loophole that was used to turn uh, nine men over to federal immigration officials. So, what exactly happened here? Why did the why did the cops and how did the cops get around this particular act? The, the nine men turned over uh, by Boston police. Uh, they were turned over before the men were eligible for release. Remember that part in the Trust Act that says Boston police can't hold anybody longer? Well, this is a loophole. This is, you know, this is before they were ordered released. The Trust Act kicks in after they're ordered released by a judge. So this is a highly technical thing that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around. And, and the, frankly, the, the nine people um, who were turned over probably wouldn't um, elicit that much sympathy because the Obama administration said, look, we're, we're going to only request um, serious criminals. And, and these, these folks did have very serious criminal records for the most part, it appeared. Um, now, that said, uh, Trump can come in and change everything. Trump can say, um, uh, I want to try to, you know, deport people who are pulled over, who ran stop signs. Um, and they came, that's how they came into contact with the local police. And perhaps through a loophole like this, um, that could happen. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is we don't really know how the trust acts are playing out because the immigration arrests are secret. There's no police log like there is for the regular, you know, police department um, that you see in the newspaper or you see online. Um, and, and the court records in immigration court are not public either. So it's very, very difficult to uh, really see how this is playing out behind the scenes. The immigration system is secret. And, and that's the problem. If you roll back just a few years to the controversy in Massachusetts and, and elsewhere in New England over secure communities, um, that still exists. Some people think it doesn't. It's called Priority Enforcement Program. So um, under that program, uh, a f- federal official said, we're making the streets safer. We're deporting people who are criminals. But in Massachusetts, we could see that about half the people they deported had no criminal convictions. So we would ask them, well, well what about this half that you didn't, you know, that you deported? What about them? And we would be reassured, oh, well, those were gang members or gang as- associates. But it took us years to prove, because the system's secret, that they were also deporting people or, or pursuing people for traffic, stop for traffic violations and other minor offenses. So there's a, this secrecy has caused a lot of mistrust in immigrant communities. This is all playing against the backdrop of a report that you did with the Globe last year about uh, criminal immigrants who stay in the United States, specifically here in New England. And it had some really interesting findings. I'm wondering if you can tell us what you found about the immigrants who are here in New England and at what level they tend to reoffend uh, after their crimes. Right. So, so that lawsuit um, stemmed from a 2012 series um, we did on secrecy in the immigration system, kind of a theme I, I keep returning to, seeking uh, the names of the criminals who are released because the government was unable to deport them. Now, in the past, immigration officials had told Congress and the public that the reoffender rate was very low. Um, so we, we prevailed in that lawsuit, uh, and, and we decided to look at three, the cases of 323 immigrants released in New England. And we found that in, in those cases, actually, the reoffender rate was much higher. It was um, 30 percent, possibly higher than that as well. But um, th- this is something the government could have easily done on its own um, by looking at uh, their own internal records, but um, haven't bothered to do. 
so that's uh, there. There are some other things we found out um, in, in looking at that. Uh, not only did federal immigration officials mislead Congress and the public about the reoffender rate, but they're also f- releasing sex offenders without uh, registering them. So, w- so we had no idea that was happening. That ICE didn't have. Um, a system in place to um, make sure sex offenders registered. Often ICE would take someone who had been convicted of a very serious crime directly from prison and put them in a detention center somewhere perhaps across the country and then release them. So as an immigration reporter, what are the stories that you're looking ahead to really focusing in on during the first hundred days or so of the Trump administration? The biggest issue that I think most in the public have lost sight of is that is that this is secret. You know, we should not pretend as journalists to know that we know who he's arresting um, and what is happening to them in the courtrooms because we're we're not going to know that. But that is something we don't know under Obama and we didn't know under Bush. And we we, as far as I know right now, are not going to know under Trump. Maria Sacchetti from the Boston Globe. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Coming up, how did a small utility company in Burlington, Vermont, become a front page story about Russian hackers gaining access to the U.S. electric grid. Find out next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. President-elect Donald Trump finally said that he agreed with one piece of information from U.S. intelligence, admitting that, I think it was Russia that hacked into the Democratic National Committee. But there is another story of Russian hacking aimed at a smaller target, Burlington Electric. It's a city-owned utility in Vermont. The Washington Post story over the New Year's weekend was pretty scary. It said that Russian hackers penetrated the U.S. electricity grid through this hack. But that story, it turned out to be not true, and it caused a mess for the utility. Reporter Taylor Dobbs covered the incident for Vermont Public Radio, and he says the story turns out to be more about what went right than what went wrong. Taylor, welcome to Next. Good to be here. So first of all, tell us exactly what happened. How is it that this small electric company in Vermont got tied up in a Russian hacking scandal and in the Washington Post was involved? Explain what happened here. Sure. So on the last week of 2016, the federal government, as part of sort of normal operations, announced to utilities that there's a set of malicious or questionable Internet traffic and malware that utilities all over the country should be looking for on their networks. And so Burlington Electric, the city-owned utility in Burlington, Vermont, started scanning for these things on its network. And on Friday, January 30th, they picked up a piece of internet traffic that was connecting to an IP address that was on this list that the Homeland Security officials had provided for monitoring. And so they self-reported that to the federal government to say, hey, we had this questionable activity that you wanted us to be watching for. We just wanted to let you know that we saw it. We have disconnected that computer from the network and, you know, we're looking into it. So they reported that they may have been infiltrated by this suspect malware. But then somehow or other, we read a big headline in The Washington Post that says that a local electric company has essentially been hacked by these Russian hackers. And that sends off all sorts of fears. You know, can the Russians hack into an American utility company? But this isn't what happened. The Washington Post story, the big headline that ran that night, the same day that they detected this suspicious connection, the Washington Post story said that the Russians had gotten into the electric grid and sort of established at least a little bit of control so that potentially at the flip of a switch or click of a button, some Russian hacker somewhere could turn off the lights somewhere in New England or maybe just in Burlington. We didn't really know, but the point was that the Russians were in the electric grid and they had some sort of control. And in fact, that never happened. And this Washington Post story was based entirely on an anonymous official in the federal government who apparently just fed them bad information because reporting it out afterwards, it seems clear from every official that I've talked to that this 
suspicious activity never broached the grid. There was never any suspicion or concern that the electric grid was actually under Russian control. This is basically a, a laptop or a computer that was not connected to the rest of the system. Couldn't have caused a problem, but the electric utility in self-reporting this, I guess, got somebody confused and then he, he leaked bad information to the Post. Right. It was very bizarre because, in essence, this was a story of all of the systems that are in place to protect the U.S. electric grid working out. The Homeland Security agencies are always looking for new cyber threats. Utilities are always scanning for these new cyber threats that are discovered by federal authorities. And in this case, they found one. They disconnected it from the business network. And I've been assured by utility officials that this computer did not have access to the grid network. So we've spent a lot of time covering the electric utilities and the other utility structures across New England because they're fascinating and there's an awful lot of change happening in these systems. A lot of New England is covered by big electric utilities like Eversource that span multiple states. Here you're talking about a small electric utility that's city-owned. How did they handle all of this attention? I mean, what did all this mean for Burlington Electric? Well, it was somewhat unfortunate because, of course, it's a holiday weekend. This story was reported on January 30th, and the Washington Post story broke on Friday night, Friday evening at around 7.55, and the officials I talked to said they were dealing with it nonstop, basically starting that minute um, all through the weekend. I did my interviews with them on Tuesday, and they were, of course, still talking about it then. So it was just a massive wave of attention. I mean, they had it reported by CNN, of course, the Washington Post, and all of these national outlets picked it up. And so they were dealing with trying to, at the same time as it's being reported that they have been badly compromised, they're saying, first of all, we weren't badly compromised. And second of all, we have systems in place. We are not some small little podunk utility that doesn't know what we're doing with cybersecurity. All these small utilities are working closely with the federal government, as we learned, to make sure this type of thing doesn't happen. And in this case, it was just wrongly reported that it did happen. And that's really why it blew up into a huge story. Do we believe that Burlington Electric, the other utility company in Vermont, or the other utilities around New England, that they actually do have systems in place to look for this sort of thing? Because we all were scared about this potential hack, but it also seemed very plausible given some of the uh, uh, cyber attacks that have been happening around America. Right, it did. And I think part of this story and part of the reason that the Washington Post story went so viral was because this is something that people were sort of primed to hear. It was a holiday weekend. We've seen tons of cyber attacks over the holidays in the past. It was a small utility, so we wouldn't have expected them to be up with the latest cybersecurity technology. And so we are ready to see this kind of thing. But I also think that, you know, authorities know this. And so I, I was looking around at other utilities in the area after this story broke to see, you know, what cybersecurity provisions are in place at these smaller utilities where it might be sort of an easy way into the national electric grid. And it looks like the federal government actually is doing a really widespread effort to be in touch with these smaller utilities and really kind of use the federal government's major resources to help these smaller utilities to detect and protect against cyber threats like this. And there are a ton of rules in place, too, to prevent the everyday browser. Someone, for example, in this case, was just going to yahoo.com to check their email at Yahoo Mail and it connected to the suspicious address. And that type of activity, all these systems are, at least in theory, they're designed to prevent somebody who's just browsing around the internet and runs into some gnarly malware or connects to a malicious server. That's supposed to be protected from the grid. No one who's on a computer doing that sort of thing should be on a computer that is controlling the grid. And I think these utilities have systems in place to prevent that. And it's just a matter of whether the utilities are doing a good job following their systems, implementing them, and making sure that all of the staff are trained not to compromise the system. Because in most of these cybersecurity stories, it's really the human error that lets the problem happen and not the systems in place. Taylor, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Happy to be here. Taylor Dobbs is a digital reporter at Vermont Public Radio. On January 16th, we celebrate the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., He's a figure we don't usually associate with New England, but two summers the King spent in Connecticut as a young man 
likely stoked his passion for achieving equality for African Americans. King was just 15 when he traveled to Simsbury, Connecticut, then a small town outside of Hartford, to spend the summer working on a tobacco farm. Here's a clip from a speech he gave on a return trip to Hartford in 1959. When I was a freshman in college some 15 years ago, several of my fellow students, I joined several of my fellow students in coming to Connecticut to work for the summer on one of the tobacco farms. And this was called the Coleman Brothers Farm down uh, it's near Simsbury, Connecticut. And all week long we would work very hard and the sun was very hot and it was always a big relief for the weekend to come around when we could come to Hartford. Connecticut tobacco is grown in the shade, but it was actually hotter under the gauze tents that shaded the field than in the sun. The students' time off from the tobacco fields was sweet relief, and not just from the hard work, but from life under segregation in the South. To find out more about Dr. Martin Luther King's formative summers in Connecticut, I'm now joined by Elaine Lang. She's past president of the Simsbury Historical Society. Elaine, welcome to Next. Hi, nice to be here. So first of all, tell us when Martin Luther King was in Simsbury, Connecticut. Dr. King came up with a bunch of fellow Morehouse College students for the first time in 1944. A lot of our local tobacco farms in the central Connecticut region sponsored groups of students from the historically black college and universities in the South and would bring them up. They would ride the train up, work in the fields for the summer, live in a dorm, and if they stayed through the growing season, they would have their train ticket home would also be paid for. He came up for the first time in 1944, and then several summers later came back in the summer of 1947. And so students like Dr. King were being recruited from the historically black colleges to come north and work in, in these tobacco fields. Tell us a bit more about that. It was cost effective for the tobacco companies. The companies found they had better results with uh, these workers than some that they were trying to hire elsewhere. For the students' perspective, they would get paid more than they would be able to earn in the South. And there were also some suggestions by some recruiters that it was a safer summer for a young black man to be in the North and work rather than be in the South, especially in areas where the hate groups were still very often becoming violent. So when, when Dr. King first came to Simsbury in 1944, he was just about to go into Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. He's 15 years old. A lot of the students were younger at that point. If a student was qualified academically to attend. It wasn't as set a path as we have now of students going through four years of high school and then four years of college. A lot of very bright, even brilliant people like Dr. King were able to start at a much younger age. There are lots of stories that have been told about him as a young leader at the camp. He led a lot of the prayer meetings. He was very popular. One tale that has been told is that a popular hazing ritual was that uh, Everybody would flip a bed over, and you'd flip the next person down the line of the beds in the dorm, and that person would have to scramble to get their stuff put back in order before it was time to go to work in the morning. The story went that when young Michael King, as he was then known, his bed got flipped, and the next day he got up and he announced the bed flipping stops with me and did not flip the next worker's bed. Tell us about what life was like in these, in these dormitory-style living conditions. The dorms were large, just like you'd imagine a large room with a number of single beds in them. They would get up at 6 in the morning and eat breakfast together and then work in the fields all day. And then they would have a few breaks but then come back for a communal dinner. They also had recreational opportunities. Sports groups would crop up. There were always prayer groups, and there were often recreational trips, trips to local restaurants. In Simsbury, they would walk down to the center of town. They would eat at the lunch counters and attend films in the local community center. You, you talked about the, the outings that Dr. King and the other students would have, and in some of his writings and speeches he's given about his time, you get a sense that there was a little bit of a, a formative moment that he had by spending time in the North as a young man 
in seeing how life for a young black person might be quite a bit different than where he was living. He wrote back to his father several times that he was amazed that they went into Hartford and ate at a nice restaurant where they walked in the front door and and were treated kindly by waiters and not had food shoved out a back window the way you would in a segregated community. He commented about worshiping in our local churches with local people, that they were asked to sing in the choir and that the black people and white people would attend church services together and would not have separate seating areas even. He, in his later years, reflected back in particular on the train ride home, how he would ride in a regular passenger car like anyone else on the ride to Washington and then at Union Station in Washington would have to switch to the segregated Jim Crow rail cars to continue on back to Atlanta. And that very strange kind of line in the sand of you're segregated here and oh, magically you've crossed over a line and now you can freely move was striking to him. Elaine Ling, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. There's a short documentary about King's time in Connecticut produced by students at Simsbury High School, and we've posted it on our website. It's nextnewengland.org. After the break, the second greatest show on earth. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Melville Charitable Trust, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of housing and homelessness. There's a new and controversial plan to build a hotel in an unlikely place near the top of Mount Washington in New Hampshire. The 35-room hotel is still in the planning stages. New Hampshire Public Radio reports that the developer has met with the local planning board but that more than 6,000 people have signed a petition against it. Famously home to the world's worst weather, Mount Washington is the tallest mountain in the Northeast, and it already hosts a huge amount of tourist infrastructure. In fact, P.T. Barnum once stood at the summit and called the mountaintop the second greatest show on Earth. Our next segment is from the New Hampshire Public Radio podcast, Outside In. Host Sam Evans-Brown and producer Taylor Quimby bring us the tale of how Mount Washington was conquered, and how that process became the template for mountain tourism worldwide. P.T. Barnum didn't really know it when he stood on the summit, but Mount Washington is sort of a meteorological freak show. It sits squarely at the intersection of three major storm tracks in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. At less than 6,300 feet, it's barely a hill compared to peaks in the Rockies, the Alps, or the Himalayas. And yet, Mount Washington is routinely placed alongside Everest and K2 as one of the deadliest in the world. In the winter, the climate is Arctic, literally. Even in the summer, warm, sunny temperatures can drop suddenly to freezing. In the year 1900, a man named Bill Curtis, a big, burly guy, sometimes called the father of American amateur athletics, died in an ice storm near the peak. An ice storm in June. In total, Nearly 150 people have met their end on or near Mount Washington, usually because of poor planning. And then there's the record. On April 10th, 1934, five men were camped inside a small weather observatory on the peak when a massive storm swept in. Also witnessing the storm were nine cats. Observer Sal Palukia wrote about the storm in his logbook. I dropped all other activities and concentrated on observations. Everyone in the house was mobilized as during a war attack and assigned a job. It was during that storm that the crew witnessed what was then the highest wind speed ever recorded, 231 miles per hour, which is as powerful as an F4 tornado. Will they believe it was our first thought. I felt then the full responsibility of that startling measurement. Was my timing correct? Was the method okay? Was the calibration curve right? Was the stopwatch accurate? It was, and the measurement is one reason Mount Washington calls itself home of the world's worst weather. You've stumbled through the fogs of London. You've been soaked in Seattle, but nothing compares to Mount Washington, home of the world's very worst weather. 
The slogan is debatable, but the weather is pretty nasty, and it has sold a lot of bumper stickers. If you dislike the weather in your home, come to Mount Washington. It's even worse. Today, the mountain is much more of a circus than ever. There's an eight-mile road to the summit that tourists can pay to drive up in the summer. You can also summit by way of the famous Cog Railway, a marvel of engineering that dates back to the 1860s. At the top, there's a giant parking lot, a sturdy communications tower, the old observatory, now a museum, and a three-and-a-half million dollar visitor center and weather observatory that's built into the side of the mountain like a concrete iceberg. Want to see the summit right now? You can. There's a live stream on the Mount Washington Observatory website that feeds images from the peak 24-7. To find a time before all of this madness, a time when the peak was still just a pile of loose rocks hiding in the clouds, you have to go back almost 200 years. The first known cabin on Mount Washington was built in the early 1820s by a guy named Ethan Allen Crawford. It was about a mile from the summit. Ethan Allen came from a family of total badasses. His father, Abel Crawford, was the first white pioneer to inhabit what we now call Crawford Notch, a gorge that runs along the presidential range's western side. At age 75, Abel became the first person to summit Mount Washington by horse. So badass. But it was his son, Ethan Allen, who carved the bridle path and led him up there. He was a big, burly dude. According to an 1855 guidebook by John Spaulding, people called him the White Mountain Giant. The first display of Ethan's giant strength recorded is of his carrying on his head across the Amanusik River a potash kettle weighing 400 pounds. According to Spaulding, Ethan Allen would catch wild bucks and mountain lions in the forest and carry them home on his shoulders. He trapped 10 bears in a single fall and kept one of them as a pet. He was like the Paul Bunyan of New England. Ethan Allen and his dad ran an inn in Crawford Notch and were the first guys to take tourists up Mount Washington. Travelers were probably just as excited to see the White Mountain Giant as they were to see the White Mountains themselves. Step right up, folks, for a chance to see the bear taming, bobcat slaying, kindly and compassionate colossus, Ethan Allen Crawford. In the early 1800s, tourists were few and far between, maybe a dozen a year. But in the 1820s, a medical scare started to sweep the nation, and the Crawfords were perfectly poised to cash in. There begins to be a discussion, both in the medical press and then in the sort of public press, about how, you know, taking time off from work might be good for you. Uh, It could refresh you. Uh, You would be better at your job. This is Cindy Aaron, by the way, a professor of history emerita at the University of Virginia. People began to worry that middle class men were suffering from what was called brain fatigue. Brain fatigue. There were fancy resorts popping up all over the place, in places like Newport, White Sulphur Springs, Saratoga, but... The problem with vacations for 19th century Americans uh, is that vacationers were at leisure, allegedly, and leisure held all sorts of dangers. You might be tempted to drink, to gamble, because they were like bowling alleys at these places. Bowling alleys. So because there were these dangers at these fashionable resorts, what you find in the last half of the 19th century is all sorts of vacations, uh, types of vacations emerging where middle-class people could take them, but they wouldn't have to worry about the dangers of too much idleness. So this is where you get the introduction of historical sightseeing, of professional development trips, and camping. And if you were camping, of course, you couldn't be idle. You had to pitch a tent. You had to go out and forage for food. You didn't have to worry about being at a fashionable resort where you might, you know, meet a handsome stranger or a pretty stranger and start flirting. But camping in the 1800s isn't just about avoiding sex and booze and bowling alleys. It's also about cultivating a sophisticated persona. It's a way of asserting your bona fides. This is Dona Brown. She wrote a book about New England tourism in the 19th century. It's a way of saying I am a well-educated, but also a sensitive human being. I'm a person who understands scenery, who values non-monetary things, who values culture, who values art and spiritual experiences. You can imagine why, for these early tourists, Mount Washington was ideal. It was of historical interest as the tallest peak in the Northeast. It was aesthetically valuable because of the view. 
and it was physically demanding enough to feel like a respectable form of vacation. And should the mood strike, you could still do a little surreptitious flirting in one of the many Crawford Notch inns. The commercial development of the White Mountain region really gets started in the 1830s, and by the 1850s, you can start to see these very large-scale hotels, many of them uh, funded or sponsored by railroads. In other words, this is when the construction of the second greatest show on Earth really gets underway. In 1804, the 10th New Hampshire Turnpike shortens travel time between the Connecticut River Valley and Portland, Maine, by a full two weeks. The road runs straight through Crawford Notch, where Ethan Allen and his dad Abel were living. In 1819, Ethan Allen finishes the first bridle path up Mount Washington, significantly lowering the bar for who can get to the top and how hard it is to summit. Other kinds of infrastructure that you might not think about, too, like guidebooks, become uh, very highly organized and commercialized in the 1850s, uh, sort of almost on the same trajectory as the, as the physical infrastructure. In 1825, Gideon Davidson publishes The Fashionable Tour, a travel guide that popularizes travel from Saratoga Springs up to Niagara Falls and then back down to Boston. Later, he amends his guidebook to include a visit to the White Mountains. The emotions which one receives from the grand and majestic scenery which surround him here are utterly beyond the power of description. There is no single object upon which the eye rests and which the mind may grasp, but the vast and multiplied features of the landscape actually bewilder while they delight. Especially by the 1850s, the guidebooks give these extremely explicit instructions. Never have you felt these feelings before, it'll say. You know? <laughs> this is the feeling you feel as you stand before the awesome nature of this environment, you know? <laughs> it's like, really? I do? <laughs> So at the same time the physical infrastructure is being built by the capitalists, artists, poets, painters, and thinkers, they're building up the ideas and the feelings that we associate with these places. In 1851, the Grand Trunk Railroad announces a plan to provide rail service to Gorham, New Hampshire, a town that will later be known as the Gateway to the White Mountains. Hotels spring up to accommodate tourists, towns in the area swell in size, Mount Washington is ready to hit the big time. In the summer of 1852, Joseph Hall and Lucius Rosebrook built a hotel on top of Mount Washington. Its four-foot-thick walls were made of stone boulders blasted from the mountain's summit. The roof and sheathing were made from wooden boards carried eight miles up the bridle path by horses and men. Rosebrook himself carried the front door up on his back. To keep the roof from blowing off, they draped four two-inch thick chains over the hotel and anchored them into the bedrock with heavy bolts and cement. Rosebrook and Hall called their hotel the Summit House. Thirty hungry hikers arrived two days before the hotel was ready to open. Rosebrook and Hall had food, but no utensils, so they and their wives carved spoons and forks out of wood. In the few short weeks before the hiking season came to a close, they made around $2,200. Which in 1852 was worth, like, way more. They came back the next spring to find their hotel had survived, but their celebration was short-lived because a couple of no-good copycats decided to build another stone hotel literally yards away from the Summit House. A guy named Samuel Fitch Spaulding duplicated their design. Rocks, chains, the whole bit. Except his hotel was bigger. And it had a cooler name. It was called the Tip Top House. For one very tense year, the Summit House and the Tip Top House competed, kind of like a McDonald's that's right across the street from a Wendy's. But in 1854, the hotels joined forces. That year, Sam Spaulding's son, John, penned a White Mountain guidebook that would double as a brochure for his family's expanding mountaintop venture. These two houses are unitedly managed by a company of hardy mountaineers who spared no pains to make this famous resort a true home to the admiring stranger. Ye who would enjoy the sports of stream and forest, come to these mountains. Of course, the guidebooks don't mention the downsides of vacationing atop of Mount Washington. In one account, a group of hikers struggled to get to the top of the mountain during an August storm. When they arrived at the Summit House, the temperature was only 9 degrees, and that was next to the stove. It was 6 degrees in the dining room. Sometimes, guests would plan to stay for a night, 
only to be trapped on the summit for days before the weather cleared up enough for them to get down the mountain. But still, these sophisticated tourists came from Boston and Portland, Maine, from New York and Philadelphia, and they asserted the hell out of their bona fides. If you look in the, in the guest registers at the Crawford House, um, early on in the 1830s, it reads like a kind of list of all of the greatest writers and artists of the United States in the first half of the 19th century. It's like, you know, uh, Hawthorne was here, and you know, Thoreau was here, and all these different kinds of people who become important politicians or important cultural figures. From what some of the visitors were writing in the guest books, you can argue that people were taking their cues from the poets and the philosophers. On July 17, 1854, Mary Huntington composes this. Space, thou art pure and boundless expanse for golden globes to make their mountains in. Room, where all bodies mentioned may begin. Where planets wheel along in merry dance and comets voyage on in wild careers. But just like today, some people haven't gotten the word that climbing a mountain is supposed to be transcendent. Some just thought this was a damp, drafty, noisy hotel. Big jampers, I'd as soon sleep in a swamp. And when one gets up in the morning, his clothes hang about him like a woman's gown with now skirts. If ever I'm the bottom again, may the devil sweep me if I climb these rocks another time. Both of these entries were written a year before white men first stumbled across what would later become Yosemite National Park. Yellowstone wouldn't be explored for another 15 years. The American Civil War, hell, the invention of the bicycle was still seven years away. And already, Mount Washington had been conquered, packaged, and sold as a true American wilderness. If you look at the process by which developers of White Mountain scenery and White Mountain tourism made White Mountain scenery accessible to people. Um, it is a process that is exportable. You can then take it to Yosemite or wherever you want to take it. And when I say made it available, I'm not just thinking about trains and hotels, but I'm thinking about people who write uh, guidebooks or people who publish collections of images or painters who go there and paint images and then sell them. That, uh, that make people feel that they can understand the landscape, that the landscape has meaning for them. Wild, untouched, uninterpreted, unmediated scenery is nothing, it's just wilderness. Of course, that same process that transformed Mount Washington was exported to the West. It's that process that eventually shaped our ideas about the Grand Canyon and Old Faithful that brought us the American road trip and Route 66. And meanwhile, Mount Washington continued to transform until it really was more like P.T. Barnum's Big Top Circus than a scenic escape. First, the carriage road was constructed, then the Cog Railway, then in the 1870s, the Summit House was replaced by a mammoth three-story wooden hotel with 91 separate rooms. In 1908, everything but the tip-top house burned down in a huge blaze, and then they rebuilt it all over again. Nowadays, people don't just visit Mount Washington because of the view. They go to see the train or the Old Stone Hotel. They go to see firsthand how New England's tallest mountain became home of the world's worst weather and the second greatest show on Earth. Ye who would enjoy the sports of stream and forest, come to these mountains. Ye who delight to behold the works of nature in their most sublime flights, come to these mountains. Ye who have a love for novelty and a desire for true pleasure, come and behold God's wisdom displayed in the bold outlines of this gigantic monument of his almighty power. host Sam Evans Brown and producer Taylor Quimby reporting for New Hampshire Public Radio's podcast Outside In. We've got links and pictures at nextnewengland.org and you can find Outside In wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Next is produced at WNPR by Andrew Moraskin. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. Our digital editor is Heather Brandon. Production help this week from Chris Albertine and Annie Sinsabal. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. 
The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and it's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and WNPR. 